I am here in my capacity as Professor of Reproductive Endocrinology, not as Vice Principal International. Although I'm not entirely sure why I'm here in the, my capacity as Reproductive Endocrinology, actually. But I was invited to talk about steroids in the context of global health. And as a steroid biochemist, I thought I'd take a look backwards around the development of steroids as, 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 as wonder drugs as a way of looking forward to their relevance in the context of global health. So what I'm going to do is, is convince you, I hope, very quickly that steroids are essential medicines. Secondly, that they're entirely sustainable, affordable and efficient and effective. And I'm going to finalize the, the talk with a quick look at a, a case study of how cortisone became such a powerfully important agent in medicine. Steroids are hormones, steroid hormones, and uh, those of you in the audience who are endocrinologists will know that 2005 was the centenary of the coining of the word hormone by Starling. And amongst the pantheon of hormones, there's no question that steroids are probably the most important, preeminent of hormones. They are truly ancient molecules. They came in with the Big Bang. They've been found in shale rock. They're over 4,000 million years old. They're present across the animal and plant kingdoms. They have roles in reproduction, cardiovascular, nervous, skeletal, cancer, everything in, in pathophysiology. And they are the most widely used class of drug. Anything that's got this configuration of a perhydrocyclophenanthrene phenanthrene nucleus, represented by these ABC structures, um, is a steroid. And steroids act by interacting with receptors, which are themselves transcription factors, to regulate gene expression. They are truly fascinating molecules. And they are essential. Now, even now, in 2012, if you go to the World Health, Health Organization's model list of essential medicines and just scan through it you'll find that steroids and I've listed them on each of these slides are important for in this case antineoplastic immunosuppressives and medicines in palliative care in skin dermatology diuretics gastrointestinal hormones other endocrine medicines and of course contraceptives the pill uh, is uh, entirely, or was initially entirely a steroid based um, concept, eye preparations, and of course respiratory tract um, for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. These drugs are being used now as we speak as some of the most uh, widely used agents across the world. Uh, we were told to look at evidence for what we're talking about. Well, even now, drugs like glucocorticoids are being assessed globally for their use in the diagnosis, management and prevention of, of lung um, disorders, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Even now, vitamin D, which is itself a steroid related uh, compound, is being assessed in its potentially enormous uh, importance in uh, impact on, on, on mortality rates uh, around the world. And even now, uh, over 60 years after the introduction of the uh, pill, uh, contraceptive technology based on steroids nowadays tends to be long-acting implants are being assessed uh, throughout the developed and developing world. So it's unequivocal that steroids are essential. But are they sustainable? Are they affordable and, and effective? Can, can we afford them? This is one little pathway, not unlike the sort that Peter Gazelle that generates all the time, um, which illustrates the fact that steroids are made in the body from sterols, cholesterol being the, the principal starting point, and go through a series of metabolic changes until they end up being uh, the, the hormone, that the, the gland where they're being made um, uh, produces. So in the case of the adrenal gland, it's cortisone. And that's my example here. And but my point is that in order for steroids to be um, obtained for drugs, they used to be, the only source was to extract them from glands where they were made. 
And so, for example, in the case of cortisone, when it was first isolated, uh, it was necessary to get something like 40,000 adrenal glands to get several milligrams of an, an active agent, which of course, and this was done both in, in Europe and in the, in the United States, in Reichstein's lab and in Kendall's lab, when the, when the hormone cortisone was first isolated. So of course that's hopelessly un, unrealistic in terms of sustainability. But the good news is that you can get them from vegetables as well. And in 1943, uh, this is the, the paper in, published in 47, but in 1943, Russell Marker introduced this chemical uh, reaction known as the Marker degradation, which allowed the cheap and ready production of progesterone, an essential intermediate in hormone production, from Mexican yams, a sterol, a phytosterol called diocygenin in, in Mexican yam became the source of, of steroid hormones. And there's a wonderful history starting at the top here where steroids were only available at, at great cost uh, in very small amounts when extracted from animal glands through to the <coughs> development of the marker degradation and the realization that Mexican yams, only Mexican yams at the time were, were seen in this regard, could produce plant uh, phytosteroids which were readily converted into progesterone and thence into other hormonally active steroids for medical use. And there's a wonderful story there about the cost effectiveness and, and the, and the uh, uh, pharma uh, investments in these compounds because when when Marker first isolated his first uh, 300 kilograms of um, progesterone from the yam, it was worth, they were, that was worth $24,000 back in 1943. But within the space of a couple of years, the price had plummeted to a 250th of that, so to less than $10 um, a gram. And now um, it's the case that steroid hormones are readily, cheaply produced from other sterols in plants, such as soybeans, from cholesterol in wool and from bile acids um, from slaughterhouse um, material. And this is just a recent paper from India surveying the sources of sapogenins that yield steroids um, across the uh, uh, plant phyla of uh, plant species in, 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 in India which have been used to extract steroids. So um, my second very quick message is that steroids are sustainable. You could even get them from the Edinburgh Botanic Garden because this is the yam, <laughs> the one and only Mexican yam that's in the temperate house at the greenhouse, glass house at the uh, botanical garden. The cortisone legacy richly illustrates this point. Cortisone, initially called compound E, but then called cortisone because of, there was a worry of a confusion with vitamin E at the time was isolated, as I said before, in America by Kendall uh, and in Germany by, by Reichstein back in 1936. And immediately people wanted to use it, but they couldn't use it because it couldn't be produced in a cost-effective way uh, in sufficient amounts for use. But in the early uh, war years, in 1941, when it was rumored that the Nazi pilots were high and hopped up on, on glucocorticoids, which meant that they could fly higher than the Brits and the Americans, it became an issue. And actually, um, although the initial um, story w or rumor was unfounded, it did kickstart the American government's uh, quest, all out quest to um, get to a large-scale synthesis of cortisone. And in fact, it was prioritized over um, malarials, antimalarials, and, and penicillin. So that's how big this uh, agenda was. The timeline moves on then from there. Um, it was isolated in 36. It wasn't enough to use it until it was synthesized for the first time in 1946. This time, from bile acid. You can get bile acids for nothing from the slaughterhouse. and. This guy, Sarat, um, Lewis Sarat, who was working for Merck at the time in the States, developed a 37-step reaction from um, um, the desert cholic acid all the way through to um, um, uh, cortisone, which meant that for the first time, this material could be made in sufficient amounts to use it um, as a drug. And then, 
This chap here, uh, Philip Hench, was the clinician who did the translation. This is a wonderful story because um, Kendall isolated it. Hen um, Sarat found a way of producing it in large amounts and then Hench stuck it into a patient. And he had this idea all along that patients with rheumatoid arthritis might benefit from adrenal extracts based on the fact that when um, patients with Addison's disease had any form of, um, of um, liver um, uh, fun over function uh, that uh, there would be a potential uh, benefit. So he, um, what, as soon as he uh, found a friend, uh, Kendall, uh, producing it in sufficient amounts, amounts, he injected it into this patient. Look at this, 100 uh, milligrams. Um, th these are vastly uh, unrealistic amounts uh, pre previously. He, he quoted in his Nobel Prize winning, uh, in the lecture that celebrated his Nobel Prize, she walked out of the hospital in a gay mood and went on a shopping trip. <laughs> and so the rest was history. Um, the drug was trialed then in 1949 for rheumatoid arthritis. And then it was actually launched as an anti-inflammatory immunosuppressant and of course for hormone replacement therapy in Anderson's disease. And then it became part of the as I say, pantheon of steroid drugs um, that were studied um, <laughs> from both from a physiological as well as a patho pathological perspective throughout the, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, right up until now. And I would have to highlight this a little bit here because the only contribution I personally have made to this story was that I actually developed one of the first <laughs> rage amino assays for cortisol. In fact, the third of the three, all that were published in the same year in 1975. And this is, uh, is Guy Abraham who developed the first one. Um, this is Professor uh, Edwards, Chris Edwards, who some of you will remember as a previous Dean of Medicine here. And uh, there are some other people here you may or may not recognize from that era. Ty, good luck. Anyway, so finally it became a blockbuster generic. Um, it's still a blockbuster generic after all those years and more than ever, ever in, in conditions like asthma. And if you look, for example, at the, uh, the sort of data that are published on over-the-counter and prescription usage of drugs in the US, you'll see that um, steroids, this one's an inhaled steroid, um, are still uh, on, you know, in, the, in, the, in the top 20. They are truly wonder drugs. And this is the kind of inhalation device that's still being used. Of course, there's been many different <coughs> chemical modifications, but ultimately the, it's the same substance. So the cortisone legacy, I think, summed up by Kendall himself brilliantly in this, in, again, in his Nobel Prize lecture. Cortisone will be unique, for it is new only in the sense that it has been made available. From the time ages ago when cortisone was first made in the adrenal cortex, it has continued to serve as a powerful agent in health and disease. So my final point is that steroids are not just sustainable and um, feasible, they are forever. <laughs>